Welcome to Transformative Principle, where you learn how to be a leader and not just a manager of a to-do list. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Your to-do list is a hungry monster that is never satisfied. For the last year and a half, I've helped principals get awards, get promoted, and find the time to do the work that really matters. I recently opened a new mastermind slot. Schedule a call with me and let's overcome the stressed and isolated principal position together. Go to the show notes for this episode at transformativeprincipal.org and click schedule a call with Jethro. Welcome to Transformative Principal. This is episode 287, and I am excited to have Kip Mata on the program today. Kip, thank you so much for joining Transformative Principal and being a part of the podcast today. Uh, It's my pleasure, Jethro. Thank you. So, Kip, you are a principal in Rich, uh, Utah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and what got you to where you're at? Yeah, well, I, I did not take the traditional route to the principalship. I uh, started uh, teaching physical education in uh, a small rural school in Ohio. For I did that for one year, and then I chased basketball coaching for uh, the better part of the next 13 years, uh, junior college, college, and then I spent seven years in the NBA as an assistant coach. Uh, got tired of moving my family around and called a superintendent I knew in northern Utah and asked him if he knew of any jobs in Utah, and he asked if I could teach mathematics, and I said, yep, I teach anything. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, uh, I had to go back to school for a summer to get brushed up on my mathematics, uh, which I had a minor in and, uh, take a couple extra classes. And I started teaching that was 20, let's see, 22 years ago. I'm going on my 23rd year in rich school district, which is the small rural school district in Northeast Utah right on the border of Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho. So the idea of a principal being a former MBA coach is is pretty powerful. What parallels are there between being an MBA coach and a principal? And what, and there are a lot of differences, obviously, but talk about that from a leadership perspective. What do those two things have in common? People. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, you know, you have to deal with people and you have to build relationships and you have to build trust and it was a novelty the first five or six years. Oh, yeah, he's an NBA coach and la da da da. And then, then I turned into the math teacher. Then I turned in just to the principal and the people that come through the school now. The kids hardly even know what my past was. But everything is about relationships and about people and about doing what's best for the team, not what's best for individuals that make up the team. So when you're talking about your staff, you know, maybe your language arts teacher has this issue and you're trying to deal with that, but you have to deal with the whole team because once you change something there, it changes something in the science department or, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, same with your team. If you, if you if basketball team, if you, if you change the way you interact with one person, it affects the entire team, but it's all about relationships and it's all about people. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that I hear constantly from everybody that I talk to, whether they're principals or not on this podcast. And, you know, that idea of relationships and coming back to working together as a team, it just comes up again and again. And it's one of those core foundational principles that if you're a new principal or you've been in it for a while or you want to be a principal, that understanding of that is so incredibly vital. And it doesn't, doesn't diminish as you get more experience you still need to focus on the people and the relationships and that is it's just one of those core principles that if you can't grasp it's going to take it's going to be real tough to do the job for sure yeah, exactly right and, and and the comment you made there about diminishing no it doesn't diminish at all in fact it as you get more experience you find out how much more important it is to build those relationships because everybody you deal with is different you know, it's just like on a basketball team, you might have one player that you can, you know, jump on and get in their face and talk, you know, be pretty harsh on them. And they react to that. Uh, you have another player that if you try that with them, they, <laughs> they go, they go in a shell and they don't come out for a month and a half. And, and you have to understand people and the way they work together and, and build relationships and, 
you know, you mentioned earlier before we started the podcast about Jimmy Casas, and I had several things from him writing, writing personal notes to to mm -hmm. the staff and and uh, doing interviews with the students and even calling staff, parents, stuff like that. It builds that relationship. And as you get experience, you find out that that's more and more important. Yeah, absolutely. And those things matter a whole lot more. I, my first year up here in Fairbanks, I, I was really, you know, you're always excited about the first day of school. And I was especially excited about this school here because there was so much opportunity. And I told the kids that I felt like on the first day of school, I told them in the assembly that we had, I felt like it was Christmas morning and I couldn't wait to unwrap all these wonderful gifts that I got and get to know all the kids. And I had a number of parents who I talked to later say that that was a unique and interesting way of letting the kids know that I really cared about them individually yeah. and that I saw them as individuals. And that was not something that was planned. That was just me speaking from my heart of how I really felt that it did feel like Christmas. And I was excited to see each of the presents that I got because that's how I saw them. And, and those, like, there were some people who thought that was stupid. And some kids said that Christmas thing, that was really dumb. Like they told me that later, but yeah. other kids were like, wow, I felt like you actually cared about me as a person. And, you know, like you said, every person's different and, right. you know, you can't hit, hit them all out of the park, but you can every once in a while make that connection that really makes an impact. So that's, that's really powerful. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Big time stuff. It's cool. Yeah. So our purpose in talking today was to talk about a four day school week. And I haven't interviewed anybody who's got a four day school week. And I know you've been doing it in rich for quite a few years. And so can you talk to us a little bit about what that's like and how that actually works out with only having kids in school four days per week? Yeah. Okay. So when I first came here 22 years ago, as a math teacher, we were a traditional five-day school week. Uh, previous to that, five or six years, seven years before that, they were on a four-day school week. But the state superintendent and the state school board made all schools in the state go back to five-day school week because some school districts were taking advantage or not, not doing it in what the manner in which was conducive to mm -hmm. academics. Uh, so some time went by and about 15 years ago when the diesel prices were skyrocketing out of the, you know, it's going up to almost six bucks a gallon. Yeah. Our little small district, we, we have, you know, we're, we have such a large geographical area. We have kids on the bus hour and 10 minutes one way. Mm -hmm. And when we spend, you know, an enormous amount of money on transportation. So we decided that we were going to go to try to get this four day school week. So we went and petitioned the state and with a, with a proposal. And the proposal was this, we would go to a four day school week. We would take, we would reduce our, have a waiver to reduce the 182 days of contact time down to 152 days contact time. But we had to, we had to make sure that we met the hour requirement. In the state of Utah, you have a 182 days and a 990 hours. We meet the, the, we got a waiver for the 182 days to 152, and we have 1,015 contact hours. One of the other requirements that we had to fulfill to be accepted for this four day school week was that we had to move all of our activities to Thursday after school, Friday and Saturday. So we, we have athletics in our middle school and in our high school. In our high school, our closest region game is two and a half hours away. And I know that Alaska has much of the same issues yeah. with travel. We, you know, even where kids are on the plane and they go and stay for overnight and three or four days, whatever. Yeah. And you usually sleep in the schools, by the way. Right, right. And that's, uh, we've done that too. But the uh, bottom line was the state school board said, okay, if you're going to do this, you can't reduce, you can't go to a four day school week and then take your kids out at noon, three days a week to go play athletics. You, 
because in essence, you you lose half your students in a small district. You lose half your students and half your staff every time you go play. Mm -hmm. So we made arrangements with other people in our in our district, in our conference, and they were very accommodating. And that's one of the hurdles that you would have to get over to do this, in my opinion, is that you have to talk the other schools into playing on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. which makes it difficult to hire coaches because coaches don't want to give up their weekends a lot, yeah. but it's worked for us. We've, we've been very successful with it. Our students start school at 8 AM and we get out at three 30. Our staff starts at uh, seven 30 and gets out at four 30 mm -hmm. and we get Fridays off. And we yeah. just, uh, we use that for some professional development at times. And uh, most of the time though, it's, it's filled with uh, activities. Okay, so the the real focus then is get all the schoolwork done Monday through Thursday, and then activities on Friday and Saturday. And so that's that's really what the push is. Now it doesn't seem like your your Monday through Thursday is that much longer. I mean, it's only eight to three thirty, and I think most schools are pretty close to that to that time frame. So how are you getting so many hours in? Do you does professional development on those Fridays count towards those hours or is there something else or is it just, that's just how the math works out? Nope. Nope. We, we don't, the professional development doesn't count toward contact hours. The only thing that state of Utah allows to count as contact hours outside of seat time is parent teacher conferences. So there's, there's three days built into the calendar that are parent teacher conferences that we hold in the evening and uh, we can count that as three days of contact time. We, one of the things that we do is we do not take any, hardly any breaks at all. We take, uh, we take the Monday of Labor Day off. We take half a day of Wednesday before Thanksgiving off. Mm -hmm. And we take just a week at Christmas and that's it. We don't take any spring break. We don't take any fall break. We don't take, we just don't, we don't leave school. We and we try to very very hard to protect with um, like um, in my elementary school in the elementary schools we we keep the party you know we used to have parties all the time mm -hmm. we had a five day school week we'd have a Easter party and a Christmas party and a birthday party every mm -hmm. every week we made all that stuff go away we try not to interrupt the academic school day uh, we will have some academic assemblies. We also will have some, you know, culture building assemblies and stuff like that. But on the most part, our kids are in class from eight to three thirty, except for lunch and passing time. Mm -hmm. What was an interesting thing we found the first year is I had teachers coming to me at the beginning of uh, or the end of uh, March, beginning of April saying, hey, you know, I've taught everything I'm supposed to teach in this. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? I said, go back and reteach and teach deeper, not, not, yeah. you know, teach, teach more depth and not breath. So uh, we found out that our attendance got better. Our staff attendance increased. Our test scores increased. You know, we, we ventured into this thing trying to see if we could save some money with transportation and found out that it was better for our community and our for our our district academically so we 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 were very very pleased with that yeah so the big question that a lot of people i'm sure are wondering is do you really get a three-day weekend every week or is it taken up with other things and we already talked about how sometimes there's professional development and there's always activities of some sort but if you're if you're not coaching or doing supervision during that time, does that three day weekend actually happen where you're, you know, able to be away from school and not have to think about it? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Jethro, as you know, principals, we we pretty much don't get much time off at all. Yep. Now, our staff members do if they're not if they're not tied into athletics or tied into some activity or something like that, that they get a three day weekend. One thing that we've really tried to do with our community is ask the parents and the staff to do their personal appointments, doctors and hairdressing and whatever they do on Friday. And uh, 
you know, it's it's worked out for us. There's a couple things that we did in our district. Our school board started about four years ago of offering our teachers four independent professional development days at their hourly rate, but they have to leave the district. They can't, they have to go someplace, like they have to go visit a school, they have to go to a conference, so they have to do something. And a lot of those things happen on that Friday. So hmm. that's that's something that's been and they and then to get their hourly rate, it has to be out t- outside of school time. Yeah. So it was that that's been very helpful and it encouraged teachers to go do that stuff. And then we have some professional development we do inside the district on those days. So you know it works out pretty well. Yeah. Well that's that's really cool. So talking about the logistics, when you're planning for the year, you know, you still have the same amount of hours. And because you're you've got one day less per week, the feeling it sounds like is that there's there's less time you need to be more focused. Can you talk about that transition from you know having all those parties to going to a more focused regimented process and and talk about how yeah. that how that all happened because I think that's an important aspect right well, one of the things that we've found out is that the four day school week is much more difficult for the elementary teacher uh, that has the, you know, the traditional, we're, 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 our school district is very traditional. Our, we have one, one teacher per grade level because we're so small and they have the kids all day long in the elementaries. So they had to do the first year they found out that they were behind and they had to, to actually, it helped us in our, in our venture to go down the, the uh, road of standards-based instruction and evaluation because our teachers, especially at the elementary, had to find out what those essential standards were for each of the subjects that they were teaching, math, science, language, arts, uh, reading, history, and fine-tune exactly what they were were deeming the most important things that the kids needed to know in that at that particular point in time in their in their uh, maturation so that that was a, a learning curve for especially for the elementary teachers what we found at the secondary teachers was that we were still teaching everything we were teaching before but we weren't going into in depth so at the end of the time we we were like okay well we're sitting here what you know, what should we do? Should we study for the state test or what should we do? Well, that evolved into the same thing. Find out your, identify your standards, your essential standards, and then dive into them deeper and take more time to do that. And over the, over the 15 years that we've been doing a four day school week, that's evolved to a very productive uh, model for us. Hmm. Yeah, I just I find that so fascinating that that it, it makes sense that you would move to standards based instruction because of that change in schedule. The, when you get right down to it, it really does matter what it is that you're teaching and when you're teaching it and knowing like whether or not the kids are getting it. And it's so interesting how so many different structures and systems lead to standards-based instruction as the result i mean it's 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 funny it shouldn't be funny but it is you know it is because that, i think that happens because standards-based instruction and evaluation is what we call it in our district <laughs> is the way that we should be teaching uh, you know uh, it's not the traditional way that i was brought up anyway you know you just sat there and went through the book and finished at the end of the year and went on to the next grade. Now we're diving into, okay, what is the most important, you know, five, 10 things that you must know in my class to deem yourself proficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really great. So I'm sure that there are challenges and struggles as it relates to a four day school week. What are some of those things that you run into with that? Okay, so one of the toughest things is in, in the model that we do where we have no no activities during the week is uh, fielding coaches. Now, that's a, that's a tough deal. As you know, the transformation of coaches has changed over the 
past hell, 10 years or so where the traditional I teach in the mathematics room and then I coach and then I go home has changed those math teachers or English teachers or science teachers are like, you know what? I've been spending so much time away from my family. I'm not going to coach anymore, but I'm still going to teach. So there, now there's no teaching position open to hire a coach. So you go out into the community and you hire coaches. And it's very difficult to convince people that they have to give up their entire weekend plus practice all week long. And that, that's a difficult thing. That's a hurdle that you, if you ever try to go down this route of the four-day school week, you're going to have to that, – that's something that's going to be an issue is fielding quality coaches for the for the kids the uh, people just don't like to give up their time you know people here in our community people want to go fishing and hunting and and stuff like that so uh you know they don't it's just tough to give up that time another another hurdle that we encountered but we were prepared for when we first went to the four-day school week is that we had a lot of families coming to us and saying you know this is a burden on us. Now we have to find uh, an extra day of daycare so that we can still work. And as we ventured down this road, we had our school board was very adamant that we were, we were going to focus on academics. So when the parents came to the school board and the first parent got up and said, you know, this, this is going to be hard for me because now I have to find extra daycare. Our school board said, you know what, you can stop right there. Because that's not a viable argument because we are not in the business of babysitting your kids. We're in the business of educating your kids. And this is a, the best move for us academically. Huh. And that, that pretty much put an end to the, to the parents saying, you know, it's not fair because I got to find an extra babysitter. You know, we're, education is not a babysitting service education is an educating service so wow that's a pretty powerful response and kudos to those board members for saying that yeah that was that was uh, a big deal because we had you know that that's one of the issues that everybody if you venture down this road everybody's gonna have to face that issue mm-hmm. yeah and and the school board was you know proactive in it they knew that was going to be coming and this was their stance that that we're not we're not a babysitting service we're education service yeah i'm so impressed when i hear school boards take a a strong stance on things like that where you know so often the the request is that school districts be everything to everyone and and that's just not possible all the time it's much like the principalship you know you can't can't please every single person that you come in contact with so Whatever you do, in my opinion, the most important thing is you have to do everything through the lens of what's best for the most children. And if you keep that as your focus, it usually ends up okay. You don't, you know, you're not going to please everybody all the time. That's for sure. Yeah. I think that's a really powerful, um, powerful approach to take. So what is it about the four day school week that I should be asking that I haven't asked yet? Well, I pretty much covered it, the the positives and the negatives. The one thing that we found out is that the kids come back to school on Monday much more energetic, much more recharge their batteries. Mm -hmm. Also, the staff is much like that. Now, one of the things that's a little bit of a negative for us and for me personally is, you know, we have long winters here, much like, Mm -hmm. you know, probably not as long as you have, but uh, we, we have long winters and long spring, <laughs> spring comes late. Yeah. So our March, our, our March month is very, very tough. We don't take a spring break. And at that point in time, we have to find things to motivate the kids and to motivate staff and yourself because it gets to be very tough. You, you know, you just don't have that break and it, and that, that becomes to be problematic and, uh, psychologically for everybody you just have to find ways that's what we do most of our like uh fun time kind of assemblies and uh culture building assemblies is early in the spring where it's feeling like oh you know is this ever gonna end (laughs) yeah wow and that's one of that's one of the that's one of the things that's that's a that's tough about the four-day school at least in the model that we do it 
Now, I, I don't know, I don't know how people can do the four day school week and take all the breaks that they, that, that a traditional school would take on a five day school week and still accomplish your academic goals. Another thing that we found out too was that that, that pressure, I don't know if it's pressure or that, that model where you don't take the breaks has uh, heightened our need for psychological help, I guess, or for uh, helping the students overcome some of the pressure they're under because it's, it's four days and you're trying to put everything into that. So there's a little bit more homework. There's a little bit more pressure. There's a little bit more time demand on the kids, especially in a small district where the kids are participating in all kinds of activities, plus the homework, plus the, you know, the social pressures and all that stuff. So we, we've gone down the road with some restorative practices, uh, mindfulness uh, initiative in our district to try to help to give the kids some tools to cope with that possible added pressure. And I don't know if that's directly attributed to the four day school week, I think everybody these days is is yeah. dealing with all kinds of pressures and outside influences with social media and all bit. But the bottom line is that we as principals, as we evolve in this in this practice, you know, we we've got to have some restorative practices and we've got to have some trauma informed instruction. And we've got to give the kids some tools and the staff some tools to to deal with the with the mental pressure that we put on ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that is absolutely the case. And, you know, as you were saying that, I was like, I don't think that's limited to just, uh, you know, four day school week uh, communities. Cause... No, it is, it, it's not. It's not at all. But I also think that the way that we do the four day school week, especially in, uh, in you know, uh, February, March, April, where it just gets to be long winters and hard, uh, difficult that that there's a possibility that that could increase the the demand for some restorative practices in the school. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's really insightful. Uh Kip, this has been a wonderful conversation in closing. I want to ask you the question I ask every principal who comes on, which is what is one thing a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal like you? <laughs> Go uh this time of year Find some place to go and to a conference, go read a book, go find something that's outside of your normal practice and see if you can find something new to put into your school. Not just to, to try something new, but something that will help the kids become better students, better people that will uh, in, increase the culture in your school and the environment in your school. I'm so fortunate to be a uh, part of the Utah Association of Secondary School Principals and the National Association. So I, I have the opportunity to travel to uh, many districts and see many conferences and many schools. But if you just sit in your building and you don't do anything to go out and try to find new practices, you'll become stagnant. And that's not healthy for the children. Mm. Yeah, how true. And this is uh, the week of the National Association of Secondary School Principals Conference. And last week was the elementary one. So if you are in Boston this week and listening to this on your way. Oh, make sure, actually, make sure the Boston one is not until in July. Yeah, but that's that's when people will be listening to this, Kip. <laughs> oh, <So. laughs> oops, I messed you up there. That's all right. So... <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there, but Kip is going to be there. And so if you look around for him, um, that will be a great opportunity to go up and say hello and uh, talk to him more about your questions about the four-day school week and about his extensive career that we barely touched on through this so that we could talk about the four-day work week. Um, Kip, how do people connect with you and, and learn more from you? Uh, they are more than welcome to Email me, uh, K Mata, M O T T A, at kipmata.com. They can get on the kipmata.com webpage. They can call me at the school. It's uh, Rich, R I C H, middle school. I'm available all the time. Answer the phone, I return messages. Okay. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks for being part of Transformative Principle. Jethro, my pleasure. 